Hey folks, Steve here with another Pax Romana Greco-Persian Wars video. Uh, we will be looking at turn 5 in this one. This is 450 to 425 BC, uh, which will mean at, at once we get to the end of the turn, uh, we will be officially halfway through the campaign. Um, and as it stands right now, we are looking at 20 victory points to nothing for the Eastern player. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time commenting on that. I did a lot of that in the last video. I think I have a lot to say that will be coming in the post-mortem video, which will be after whenever we are done here. Um, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. This might be a very short video as we play through. At the end of this video, I should have a pretty good idea of whether or not this is going to be the final turn that we're going to play on camera. Um, because I think if, if the turn just ends up being a lot of good for the Eastern player, then there's no hope for the Greeks coming back at, at this rate. There, there's just not a whole lot more for them to do to, to be able to make a difference enough that it will change the outcome of the game. Even if they start to do a little bit better, um, they, they are in such a hole of victory points that um, you know they can only hope to get... They can only... They, they basically have to come out ahead on victory points almost every turn going forward, and I do not think that they have a very good opportunity to do that. Um, so, it, it is how it is. Uh, so, we're just going to get right into things. I did the income, the maintenance, uh, the leader stuff. All that's already done before starting the video. The Greeks have two leaders here, a 1-3 and a 1-4, so not terribly good. So, not good timing for them. Uh, the Carthaginians have a 1-5 uh, in Carthage. The Eastern player gets a 1-4. So not not a really, not a decent amount of standout leaders. You could probably say that the Carthaginians have the best leader on the board this turn. Um, but not that there, there's much for them to do uh, with it other than to continue to take over Sicily. Which they will probably look to do. Um... And then the Eastern player really probably, like the, the East faction, the Persian faction, if they do anything, will probably be some combination of trying to take Cyrenaica back in the south and kicking the Greeks out of Ionia. The Greeks don't have a lot of options. <laughs> I did build up a, uh, a army here in uh, Tarentum, in the city. And then same thing with Athens. Um... You know, we had built those cities before. That helped a lot. That helped with our income, even when we lost Sicily. But we still lost a lot of money because of losing provinces. So, um, it it you know we're we're just hovering around um, we're just hovering around what what we can really achieve. <laughs> um, the, 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 I, I addressed this in the last video, the city's important in the long term, but we should not have waited so long. So with two Greek armies, um, a remnant army here, that is actually not so bad. I mean, there's a decent chance that the Greeks can do something. Um, in Ionia, uh, the Greeks can do something down here, maybe in the, in the Sicilies. But that's really all they can do, right? I mean, they don't have... I have to say, they don't have enough money to do a whole lot left. They have enough money for their activations, and they've got some money that if they take some cities back, or towns rather, they can repair those and get them into better shape. Um, but those are the two places that the Greeks can go. They can go to, they can go to Sicily. They can try to, to take back Sicily. That's certainly a possibility. Um, they also want to try to get into Ionia if they can. Um, alternatively, uh, they may want to try to push into Pontus again, maybe try to get into the backfield of the uh, Eastern player and really disrupt them. In fact, they, they have a have a chance that they could do it. The only problem is a lot of these ports <clears throat> are going to cause problems for any, any naval movement that might occur. And, and because the leaders aren't super great, they're okay, we can't account for a lot of movement. We just can't expect that that's going to happen. So, um, <clears throat> the, the manpower builds, I mean, you know, the, the Eastern player still has a sizable army in Egypt, quite large, without a leader. We have a decent 
small army built up in Antioch with some additional newly built uh, naval squadrons. Uh, we still have remnant forces out here from before for the east, and then uh, the Carthaginians built some more units here. Uh, and they still have a sizable army there. In almost all cases, the uh, the um, the eastern player has a tremendous advantage in cavalry, just because they can recruit cavalry where they start. Um, and cavalry in this battle system just count for so much battle shift advantage um, that it really seems tough that like that heavy infantry advantage again not super powerful. So we're gonna have the first Greek activation. They they are gonna go first, um, and they need to do something, and that's something I'm still not entirely sure what. Um, but I think maybe we're going to try to activate, um, I'm going to try to activate, uh, maybe this army to come down here and try to take Syracuse. Alternatively, um, they could try to march on through and take Lilibaeum. And in fact, that's not a bad idea for them to try since the, I, the Carthaginians left this open down here in the bottom left. Little Bayham only has galley squadrons in it. And so that was a mistake on my part. I shouldn't have done that, but um, but we'll see. So, yeah, um, let me think on this a little bit more, and then we'll get things underway. And what I'll probably just do is show you the aftermath of the activations so that this video is not incredibly long. Okay, here we are after the Greek activation. Um, we have one more minor move. I'm not sure what to do with Um But these guys didn't roll as well as I hoped for movement. And we knew, because of the card that the Eastern players stole last turn, that they're probably, uh, they were sitting on uh, a naval ambush. We couldn't actually navally move over here like we maybe would have wanted to. So we did a land series of movements to get here, and we took Lilibaeum. Um, but... We still have to deal with this army, and the east is going to get to go. So it's kind of the real problem with that move that I just made. Um, so, you know, if there's something that could be done, um, it would maybe be moving this guy, and we roll. And he gets six movement points, which is more than enough. One, two, three, four, five. Or maybe do that. Maybe we need to move him into to rent on his protection. I don't know. It's kind of the tricky thing. It's like, you know, if the East is going to go next, what can be done? Um, so on that note, the East is going to pay their one talent, and they will now activate. Okay, here we are. The... Carthaginians moved through here. We cleared a garrison, so these boats are going to have some trouble. They will need to move. Um, came through here, picked up a unit, and then landed here and just stopped. Um, if they tried to attack the city, they have a lot of cav in the Carthaginian army, but not much in a way of infantry, and so there, there would be an advantage to the Greeks holding up in the town. So uh, they don't bother to attack. They don't need to. They just need to hold these two spaces, and technically they control western Sicily. So the control situation um, is such that, uh, you know, we just don't need to worry too much about, too much about the situation. Um, so... We would go to the cup, and I'm sorry, I should have been drawing event cards. Um, it's an irrelevant one, and then... Uh, let's see, okay, it's not a big deal there. Um, okay, so just going to go to the cup. 
and we get East player again. So pay the talent. We will draw an event card. Oh, the successor wars roll on. I think this is the one that uh, is going to hurt the Greeks because the Eastern player is drawing it again. Okay, so the, the easiest thing that's going to happen, and, and what the East player can do, this hurts the Greeks, by the way. All right, six movement points with this leader, with 10 movement points to do what? Um, so we can attack towns or cities. Um, so yeah, well, I mean, why not? They're going to attack Athens. Why Why not? That's what we would do. Civil War, something or other in, in uh, Greece. So 9 to 5. Okay, two shifts. Um, okay. I think we do... Uh, let's take these guys, lose that there. I'm sorry, no, that would be minus two. And then we got to take a step loss. All right, well, good, sh good show, guys. Um, I think the Greeks are going to lose this freaking game. <laughs> they, because this puts them in a hole. If they want, if they want to get, here's the thing. This scenario is, ba is, doesn't feel balanced. Now, maybe it's not supposed to be, but it is so frustratingly imbalanced because I, I, I'll i talk about it more in the postmortem, but I, there's just a lot of issues, I think, for the Greeks that really, whatever advantages were thought up to say, oh, this advantages the Greek player, um, I, I don't think it plays out very well in terms of staying competitive. Um, Jeez. Um, yeah, I don't know what to think about all that. Um, ay, 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 ay. All right, so the East gets their moves. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot to be done here, right, guys? I mean, it, it's going to be what? Um, this guy's stuck. He can't really get far, do much of anything at this point. Um, the the East doesn't really need to do a whole lot, to be honest. Um, they could go for Serenaka, but they don't really need it. And here's the thing. This is going to get into my postmortem. As long as the Greeks continue to control Serenaka, because it's home territory of the East, the East player gets a free activation point. And they don't need to take Serenaka. There's really no game driver for them to need to take Serenaka. As far as I can tell, I mean, I, maybe I'm missing something. Um, I mean, yeah, they're missing out on the home territory. It's valid. But the damage is already done. It's not like there's a stability loss. I'm trying to see here. I mean, there's nothing in here that says you lose stability for continually not having control of a home territory. So it doesn't matter that the Greeks have Serenaka. It does not matter if the East player can continue to have victory points up and above the Greeks. It doesn't matter. It's it's a waste of effort. So, <clears throat> so in light of that, the Greeks are going to do a major move. They're going to activate their leader in Antioch. Got nine movement points. They can get to here 
with six. And then they're gonna go clear one, two, and let's say we leave the guy behind here. Three, four to pick these guys up, and then his last movement points to attack these guys. So we'll see what that looks like up in the aftermath. Okay, so things are not looking good um, for the Greeks as usual. Uh, Eastern player navally moved all the way up to here, took this, moved on through, picked up, attacked, forced the stack to retreat, um, kicked him out of Ionia proper, uh, dealt more damage than he got, um, and then did a minor move to get a Carthaginian unit in the Melita, which I'm pretty certain, control there, control there, control, 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 gives the Sicilies to the Eastern player, which um, just really makes things even worse for the, uh, the Greek player. I mean, I, there's just no getting around it, guys. I think... I think we're in deep trouble here. Um, pulled next shit. It is east again. East again. So, um, actually, come to think of it, let's see. You can't have more than two in a row, so we have to go back to the cut. All right, Greek activation. They pay their talent. Draw a card. Okay. Um, nothing happens with that. That's a boring event. Revenues and stability just changes your stability or you get money depending on, or no, you get stability depending on your money. Doesn't really help us here. Um, is there anything to do? Is there anything that we can do, um, at this point to change the game? Um, do we stop it here? I'm feeling very... Very sad by the present situation. If these Greeks try to fight that army, they're going to have uh, a lot of problems with the cavalry advantage. And they're probably going to get chewed up real bad. If they try to just move here, they're probably going to get intercepted. And they could, you know, they leave Lilibaeum, they leave Lilibaeum open to be captured. Um, if they try to do anything navally around here, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, we know we, that the East has a naval ambush card. That's going to hurt us. I feel like there's not much to do here, guys. I, I do not know if there's anything else that can be done to change the state of the game. Um, so I'm, I'm going to think through this. Maybe I'll play through the chits off camera and, and figure out if there's anything left that could be done. And then we just come back. Maybe this will be a short video. I mean, it just... it it. It is what it is. If, if one side wins, one side wins. But it's just frustrating knowing that we've been on the back foot almost the whole game as the Greeks. Um, maybe I could have played things differently. Maybe I'm not playing optimally. That's always the case one way or the other. Uh, but it has been a tough game. Okay, guys, we're, we're going to call this one. So I just played through the rest of the turn. Um, Eastern player even got to the point where they just passed. They didn't need to do anything. They're, they're fine. They're sitting pretty. They've got plenty of forces outnumbering. The Greeks, and, and they really could have entertained the idea of coming down in here and taking Athens and causing a lot of other havoc. The uh, Etruscans got to activate. They took Neapolis. Greeks tried to take it back. I rolled poorly. Um, that's really it. We get to the end of this turn. Uh, the victory points will go up another five for the Eastern player. And that is it. That is it. Um, now, next turn, so put it this way, next turn, the Greeks would have to gain both a Civ point advantage and a GOP advantage to get five points, and they would have to do that for the next four turns afterwards to match the Eastern player's victory point total and get a draw. All we'd have to do is play through one more turn if the East even got a little bit, even got one of the categories um, it would make it basically impossible for the Greeks to win the game in the long term, even through turn 10. 
So I think it's worth calling. There's no sense in playing it out. I mean, I could have fun playing it out, but here's what's going to happen. I think the East, I think the Carthaginians are going to uh, eventually be able to just knock these guys out, chew them up, or come back behind them, take this territory. Come in here, take this territory. Uh, because the Greeks' income will be so low that they just can't, they can't compete. The snowball effect has, has reached its zenith, I think, and we would just see a complete collapse. I mean, already, the Eastern player could have optionally moved by sea, come down to Athens, take Athens, take Greece, just or, uh, take Sparta, uh, Athens and Sparta, and, and basically just completely make it so that the, the East or the Greeks can't come back. They can't build enough forces to make a difference. They cannot operate uh, enough to make a difference uh, in the big scheme of things. And so um, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at how long I've been recording. We'll maybe do a post-mortem in this video. Um, I'll have to look at that. If I don't, I'll, I'll the, this video will continue for a second and I'll just note that. But um, we may just do the post-mortem here. Um, and I'll talk about uh, what I really think of the scenario and kind of what some tweaks I would make to fix this because I think there are some needed. Um, so, yeah, let me take a look. All right, guys, I'm, I'm calling it. I'm calling it done, and we'll, we'll talk through the post-mortem here in the rest of the video. Um, and kind of a bummer, you know, it's like you have a 10-turn scenario you really want to play through most of the turns, but... It, it just has become a very um, very depressing state for the Greeks that they just cannot let up. Um, now, it, it, in most of my post-mortem videos that I do for game coverage series that I do, it you know, usually a dedicated video. Not so here, but I think we've got enough time to chat through it. Um, and it's tough to say, like, you know, what these videos are typically, the postmortems anyway, are really meant to talk about the strategy and how the game played out. Ultimately, I, I am not prepared to do a review for Pax Romana because this is just me playing a C3i magazine scenario. It's not really the base game, and it would feel a bit odd to do a review for the whole product based on this one scenario. So I'm not going to do a review for Pax Romana, not yet. Um, I, I, maybe we do a whole base game grand campaign before I do that. That's probably when I would decide to do a review. Um, I for sure get the feeling like this is probably a better game played opposed with multiple people than just solo. I mean, you can do solo, right? I think, that's, I think it's fine to do that. But I think you would get more enjoyment from a multiplayer experience, even just 1v1 in this scenario because you don't know how other personalities are going to play into the way the game pans out. So I, I'd say I'm pretty aggressive in a lot of games. Um, not all the time, but I'm certainly aggressive. And, in, and when I play solo, sometimes I'm not as aggressive, but I, I, you know, I get into that mindset of like, okay, well, yeah, let's go, let's go hit them. And I think in this game, Aggressiveness helps. Um, the only issue is that, at least in this particular scenario, the East being aggressive early has a lot more paying of dividends than the other way around. Um, because they have a little bit more cushion to absorb failure at the beginning, it feels like. Because they're controlling two different powers, right, both the East and Carthage, um, they can afford to kind of mess up somewhere. But, but I think being aggressive helps in this game no matter who you are because if you're taking stuff from your opponent your opponent's going to spend their finite number of activations trying to fend you off or maybe attack you somewhere else hoping to do as much damage as you've just done to them right it's kind of the way to think it through um but the eastern player could basically look at the board and say well i i'm gonna i'm gonna be aggressive i'm gonna try to take them down um and as soon as that worked out for them, which it, maybe the dice in combats might have steered this in a completely different way over time, um, if they could capitalize that and, and cripple the Greeks a little bit and just keep them off balance, they would just by default hold a position uh, in the lead, right? Now, the way the victory points work 
where you compare everyone's civilization points and GOP points, comes down to who has the most, gets the most victory points in that category. In a four-player game, remember this is a two-player scenario, you can't make it even three players technically, in a, in a very strictly um, two-player scenario, it's going to be one player or the other who's going to come out ahead on that, right? Um, in, in either category. So you could have one player win in one category, a different player win in the other, and maybe the victory point difference isn't as pronounced. But if you get into this case, obviously, where one player has the advantage, they get all the victory points, it can end up in the state like we saw, saw here, where we just know there's no way to come out of that hole. Um, and in, in this system, it certainly feels like you are stuck in that very tough situation of snowballing where if you're down in a multiplayer game, let's say a four-player game, if you're down, then maybe you can convince other people at the table and say, hey, listen, I, I'm i getting my butt kicked. Why are you spending time on me? You're going to let you know Rome get away and win the game if you just keep beating up on me. Go beat up on him. That kind of thing happens in a multiplayer game all the time, right? Beat up the leader, that kind of thing. So if you're really down, there's a natural release of pressure a little bit where you can kind of be afforded some ability to come back a little a little bit. Not always. Depends who you're playing with, right? And social interaction and all that. Um, and either way, if somebody is snowballing, you know, if one player, let's say we were playing with like Rome, Carthage, Greece, the East in a standard game. Let's say the East starts beating up the Greeks real bad. And, and the East is going to come out on top. That gives the Romans and the Carthaginians an opportunity to say, hey, let's stop what we're doing. Let's kind of, let's back up the Greeks. Let's try to maintain a balance of power. Let's beat up on the East a little bit. Try to keep them, keep them down. And, who, and whichever of us does better against the East maybe becomes the new leader. And so in a four-player game, I can imagine, or a three-player game, there's a lot of the back and forth and, and going around and beating up on each other a lot. Um, where the lead is constantly shifting, but that's probably where you're able to have a lot of fun, right? Because you're in the, the the margins. You're fighting in the margins to see who's going to win the game. And that's much more interesting, I think, than a two-player game where if one side just kicks it out ahead, you're not going to see all 10 turns be very valuable. Because um, as we saw with the East, it was just like, okay, they're they're clearly winning. The only person who can stop the East is the Greeks, now, the event cards provide the possibility with, like, barbarian invasions and tribal stuff that that could have maybe been pointed at the east to slow them down. But with the luck of the draw, the east got the most benefit out of the event cards. It also has to do with the fact that they had more activation markers every turn. And the reason they had the most activation markers is because of the special rule in the C3I scenario that gives you an extra activation marker if your opponent controls one of your home territories and and that special rule by the way it, it is doubly weird because it it i'm not sure i agree with the idea of it Th this is the actual thing here it's the quarreling greeks imperial overreach carthaginian council another power controls one or more provinces of the player's home territory doesn't affect your treasury but you get uh you get an extra activation marker right? So it's like it's it helps you, but listen, if you're already winning the game and you're doing very well and you've just let your opponent get control of a territory, then uh, you get an advantage. And it wasn't like, I mean, I guess what the Greeks could have done is intentionally pulled out of Serenaca and destroyed their own town or whatever, but like, okay, and then now they're losing money for it. And maybe that's something that the Greeks should have done. They should have recognized the challenge in doing that. Um, that's probably what they should have done, I guess, in terms of strategy. They, they should have evacuated Serenaca because it doesn't... The cost or the benefit is if you don't make it a city, Serenaca gives the Greek player one talent for the province and one talent for the town that they keep there, right? Maybe you try to destroy the town. I, I can't remember if you can intentionally destroy your own town. I think maybe you can. Um, so, so you pull out, you try to get the heck out of there, right? 
So you lose out on two talents per turn. Okay, you can maybe make that up elsewhere. Um, and you're giving up a Civ point and you're giving up a GOP point. You're probably giving the Eastern player another GOP and another talent. But you're taking an activation marker away from them, so then it's three activation markers to three. And that's a whole lot better because I'm telling you, when you look at how many activations you get, each activation marker is two minors and a major. You, every turn the Eastern player got an extra major move and two extra minor moves. Every turn over top the Greeks, which usually meant that they would get either back-to-back -back activations or they would get to go last in the turn and really pull off. And I think going last is actually very valuable in this game. Whereas the last person to go, you could really focus on taking actions that will impact the Civ and GOP calculation at the end of the turn. And the East player almost always got to go last because they just had more chits. It just came out that way where they were better able to do that. So I don't think I like the Quarreling Greeks, Imperial Overreach, and Carthaginian Council table special rule that comes with the scenario because I would be happy to just drop that entirely. Just not include it. Just don't even include that rule. Um, there's still an incentive for the Eastern player to take Serenaka back if you do that. And there's no weird incentive to not get it back. Now, you could imagine that the opposite could be true, right? If the East took Thrace, it's probably the most likely one they would take initially, then the Greeks could probably benefit from having that activation marker for sure. So it's this weird thing. Like, I guess, I, as I talk through it, I guess the reality is smart play on the Greek side would have been to pull out of Serenaka, just completely abandon it. If, if they were losing everywhere else, stop giving the Persian player the extra, extra activation marker. You can at least pull out of there, you know, save some units, get, get the heck out of Dodge, you lose some income, but now, you know, you don't have a weird place that's hard to get to because Saranaka, by the way, it's not an easy place to focus effort on as the Greeks. It's a very tough colony because you you have to either get there by tracing all, along through here. And remember, Brutium is part of Greece in this scenario. You have to navigate through Sicily and through Carthage. Dangerous, not likely. Otherwise, you have to go through a deep sea transit point, which is dangerous and not always a good idea. Or otherwise, you're going through Eastern Territory. So it's this weird leg out here that is not easy to defend, not worthwhile. And it gives the Eastern player a huge benefit for you being down here. So I say, pull the heck out. Get the heck out of it. Um, a mistake in my game, because I didn't appreciate it. By midpoint, it, just, it was hard to figure out how to spend the actions to get him out of there. And that's like a penalty. It's an it's a activation tax to do any of that stuff, to get out of Serenaka. It, it is hard to do that. Um, and so to me, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily make sense to be trying to, to, to stay there. Um, and there's probably a point where maybe this guy should have taken attrition, but this guy would have been fine in the town. So it's about getting rid of the town, basically. And it's hard to get to. If you look, you've got to come through C, and if you're not coming through C, you have to come through these transit points, and if you go from Leptis Magna, that's one, two, three, four, no, five, just to get to here, six, seven. And even from Egypt, if you're not going by naval, you're going one, two, three, four. And remember, you, you have to spend the extra movement point to attack someplace. So the Eastern player has to have a lot of movement points to spend to, to try to take Serenaka back. And if they're doing well everywhere else, they're benefited from not taking it back. So I think that in terms of strategy, I think that means that the Greek player pulls out of Serenaka, and that's their best hope. The other thing would be, um, and I mentioned this in previous video, I waited too long to build cities. As the Greeks, I think you probably want to try to get cities going as quickly as possible, right? Put the put the polis in, in you know, put the is in the polis, uh, is in the polis, to actually build the cities. You need to get the cities going. That is the one benefit that the Greeks do have, I, I think when uh, the author of the scenario put this together, right, Dan, I think, attempted to create some asymmetry in the capabilities of the two factions, right? 
Um, the Greeks can build heavy infantry. They're the only ones who can. That also means they're the only ones who can build new cities. The East can take cities, but they cannot build cities. So, so the Eastern player, if they capture uh, the city that is not named Alexandria, then they get another city. That's the only way they can sort of naturally get one as they go reconquer Egypt, which they will probably want to do at some point. It's a valuable province. So they can get a city that way. Otherwise, their expansion for civ points comes into towns. And if towns are relatively safe, they can just build a whole lot of them. Not hard to do. The Greeks, by comparison, I think definitely want to focus on building up their cities and building more towns. But they tend to have a whole lot more problems with income, generally speaking. So I, I think the, the cities, their ability to just in, you know improve towns into cities has to be done early. Um, they have to really commit to doing that and protecting them so that they actually get the benefit of uh, the payback. Now, obviously, an Eastern player could come in here, swoop in, and take these cities, and that's how they can get cities. They have to conquer the cities. They can't build them, so you have to keep that in mind. Where, where can you build cities where it's relatively safe? You have to protect them. And again, if you have less activations than your opponent, you can't protect as much because they can hit you without your ability to respond. Again, playing into that play balance thing. The, the whole idea that because the Greeks can build heavy infantry and they're the only ones that can, like, okay, does that give them any sort of battle advantage? Well, the reality is that in combat, you don't necessarily get um, combat shifts for having heavy infantry. Um, if I look at the you know, combat charts, I'm pretty sure there's nothing there that actually provides any sort of favorability to somebody who has heavy infantry versus um, those who do not, right? And you, if you take a step loss or you take a BP loss in combat, if you only have heavy infantry, you have to, you're basically going to lose two battle points even if you're only supposed to lose one. So for some, so, so for the oddity there, it is, yeah, you get three battle points for spending two talents, but if you take even a little bit of loss, you actually lose more proportionally unless you have light infantry there to absorb the hits. Now, um, in Greece, you can only raise heavy infantry, so the Greeks have this additional penalty, and it's an activation penalty. If they want light infantry, they have to raise them elsewhere and bring them into the army. So Sicily, you can get light infantry. If you push into the, Dan the Danube, uh, region, you can get light infantry and only light infantry in this scenario, but that would be something valuable to try to to try for, I guess. But then you've got to deal with these tribes. So there's all this like activity tax just to be competitive, where the Greeks need to get light infantry to absorb the hits so that their their actual heavy infantry don't get beat up and eliminated too easily. They really can't get much cavalry. The only place on the board that the Greeks have easy access to cavalry um, is technically Serenaca, so maybe that's maybe that's a reason to hold on to Serenaca. I don't know. Um, but you still got to spend the money for the cavalry to begin with. Or you try to do it in Narbonensis over in Gaul. But that's really far away from your other army. So it's like you wanted to get some cavalry and you wanted to get them all the way into Greece, you're going to have to spend... If, if you have multiple cavalry, you need a major move. If you're going to do it onesie twosie at a time, then that is uh, a minor move, I guess. But all these ports around Italy you have to deal with, and your boats might not make it to Greece. So you can't, you can't really count on the cavalry coming... Um, from Hispania or, or Gaul very easily. So you are you were left, like I was in this game, you're, you're kind of left with heavy infantry-only armies, which are fairly strong in terms of battle power, but typ typically that can't make up for the cavalry advantage that the East is going to have, where if they have two cavalry and you have none, well, that's three ships. And if your leaders are just as good and the battle power is close, and again, the Eastern player has potentially a lot more money, they can spend to build up armies. Um, they're going to match you or nearly match you in battle power. They're going to have a leader that's probably as good, and then the cavalry superiority, which will likely mean they will win most combats or at least be able to shift things in such a way 
that they will win most combats because cav cavalry supremacy is super powerful. That three shifts is super powerful. So from that angle, the, the Greeks just have so much more against them that I do not think when Dan created, I, I mean, he, I'm sure it was play tested. I'm sure there was some level of like, yes, this is good to publish in C3I. I, I have to imagine there were some issues pointed out because you just do not have you don't have a lot of capability to do much against what the east can to what the east has to put against you at least the way that the scenario is written um i do not think that the perceived benefits that the greek player gets are anywhere as near as good as what the east has in aggregate now there's a couple other things i i, I would definitely consider changing in the scenario to make it better i guess and the better is a tough way to look at it um one would be uh to separate carthage and the east a little bit more now the the scenario as written would seem to indicate that you just treat everything with with carthaginians and the east together other than they have their own counters for units so this is why I'm using the yellow control markers, just to help remind me what's what. I could have used Carthaginian markers, but you're supposed to count them the same. I don't think that's very... I, that's kind of unfair just from the get-go, right? You're dealing with two different sets of income, all combined. You're dealing with different force pools, all combined. And you're, you're facing off against just the Greeks, no matter how widespread the Greeks actually are. Um, what I would have maybe... And maybe this was the original intention, but it's not how the scenario reads. I would separate the income uh, of both sides. Now, the way the scenario is written, it looks like you combine the income. So there needs to be a little bit more of a hybrid model between, yes, the East player controls Carthage, but Carthage has to collect its own money to spend on its own units. The East gets its own money that it has to spend on its units. And then for victory points, you do combine the provinces and territories and cities and towns to compare for the, the civ point GOP comparison, right? You still do that, but you need to somehow continue to separate these guys a little bit more. And maybe you end up with, um, you know, a different mix of activation markers or something where instead of it being four, three or four East markers, Maybe the East player has to decide, like, okay, if I'm getting four markers this turn, it has to be two Carthage and two East activation markers, and you can only use a Carthaginian activation marker for Carthage and vice versa for the East. And if you're in a turn where you're only getting three, then you have to pick at the start of the turn, are you going to pick two East and one Carthage or two Carthage and one East or something like that? That might be more fair, but that would probably need playtesting too. But I just think it, it's... It's super weird, and there's nothing that kept me from doing it. It's like, hey, if Carthage did fine, and I don't feel the need to replenish my armies in Carthage, then all the income of Carthage can go to building an uber army in the east, or maybe I have more stuff I want to do. And that's a bit gamey, to, to combine two wholly separate countries' incomes and allow me, if I feel confident in one, to completely super spend on the other doesn't seem right. And and maybe I missed something in the rules, but the way I read the scenario information that it is legal to do that, if I were to do this again, I would certainly separate the incomes. Separate the incomes and just have it done that way. Um, and maybe still hold them accountable to <clears throat> the manpower limits as combined or something. Like it just, it needs to be looked over. Because um, again, based on this play, I would say the Greeks just are, are kind of unfairly treated now you could stay just historically that's the way it was and it's due to luck and various factors that allowed the greeks to come back at the tail end with alexander doing his thing and all that sure um but as, as does just a two-player game it feels like it's a tough tough gig for the greeks in general and um, it's hard to, to deal with that something else probably worth mentioning um related to this is that this is probably, if I look at all the information that I have for scenarios, amusingly, you know, for this playthrough, I, I did pick an oddball one. This is the only two-player 
10 turn scenario in the Pax Romana family of scenarios. Um, there are scenarios that are two player. In fact, there are various in the standard game uh, that comes in the, the playbook. So I think some of the two player ones are Pyrrhic War, Punic Wars, uh, Successor Seleucus in Asia Minor, and then I think this one is as well. Um, and then the rest of these are the, the bigger scenarios. And there's, there's some variation here. I won't go into each, each and every one. There's also other C3i magazine uh, scenarios that take place in like turns 9 and 10 or 8, 9, and 10. So this particular scenario, the Greco-Persian Wars, is very specifically the only scenario where two players are pitted against one another for a full 10 turns. I think it may have been more valuable to try to split this into two different scenarios. Maybe one running from turns one through five, or maybe one through four or something like that. Um, and then another going turns eight, nine, and 10, or seven, eight, nine, and 10, or something like that. Now, the reason I say this is because I think the balance does get a little kooky when we talk about the cities and the towns stuff that I mentioned. So again, the, the Greeks have that ability to build the, the cities for sure, right? Um, and in a big long game for 10 turns, you are more incentivized to do civ building stuff, um, to build new towns and build new cities because you have the ability to actually pay back the investment and have them be profitable. So you do just get that little bit more of a kick. But if you were to compare this to any of the other two-player scenarios that come with the game bog standard, those tend to be either one turn, two turn, three turn, and I think in one case there is like a five or six turn version of a scenario for two players. Three turns, four turns, five, six turns. Those are not really enough turns to be absolutely worthwhile to build new towns and cities. Because, I mean, if you're doing it, it's because you're trying to get an edge in civ points, which is totally valid, but you're doing that as a money expenditure more than a true investment because you're, you're not going to get your money back in a short two to three, four or five turn scenario. You're just, you're really not going to see the, the long-term benefits. Now for this game, it, it totally made sense for the Greek and the East player to think about and execute the building of new towns and cities because they knew that the long-term benefit would be pretty, pretty strong, right? But that play balance changes when you're only talking about three to four turns. For three to four turns, then what you probably want to be doing is, if you're, if you're going to be building cities and towns, you're not looking to necessarily expect to get a lot of money back, right? The, the time doesn't work. The amount of investment cost doesn't work. But at least in that case, you're making a very distinct decision on how to spend your finite money, either getting more towns and cities to bump up your civ points in the, in the in the short term because you don't really have a long term or you're building units and if you're building units your purpose of building units is to be taking territory both provinces and towns and cities from your opponent and then you're only having to pay to repair them and in a short game right you're that just basically means like unless you're going to unless you're going to build the towns and cities on the last action of the turn just to kind of get some more stuff um, on the board, period. You're more likely going to want to spend those talents on more units to activate, to grab your opponent's stuff, which tends to be, rather than a competition of outgrowing your opponent, knocking them down while taking stuff from them to bump yourself up. And I think that makes a lot more sense in a two-player situation. So some of those two-player scenarios are like Rome versus Carthage, where it's like, sure, I mean, you, you probably don't want to spend as much money building new cities, but you want to take what your opponent has. So fighting over uh, what's in Hispania, uh, Hispania, uh, fighting over this region in Sicily, rather than trying to figure out if is it, is it worth building a new town or city in Ravenna um, right away, uh, or at all, right? It's that action economy. Are you better served trying to knock your opponent down than building stuff? So in those shorter campaign scenarios, this, this whole situation of like figuring out what to do on building stuff matters a whole lot less. Um, and in a four-player game, in those 
four player games are the ones that tend to be the 10 turns, you do have a much more open field to build stuff. And again, depending, depending on player personalities and how much attention drawing you're, you're doing to yourself, you could get away with building a lot more towns and cities early because um, maybe you're sort of fending off your opponent, but you have more of an opportunity to do that. And, and maybe there's table politics going on, table negotiation. Um, you can get away with doing that without all of a sudden being knocked out of the game early. Um, you can think through that more. So I think there's just a very different use case for how you spend your actions in a two-player game that lasts 10 turns than if you're trying to play a game that is much shorter. So if you decided you were going to split this scenario, right, and say you're playing to the end of turn four with the turn one start that we set up, that might be a better game. Maybe maybe you lined it up with, uh, you know, where you had the Battle of Marathon, Plataea, and Salamis and say, like, that. that's a key, like, end point you know, the East failed to take and conquer Greece, and maybe the Greeks did well in Sicily, and it comes out to be a tie game or something, or, or however you want to interpret that. And then you pick up the scenario, you know, a, a second scenario that would need its own setup order of battle developed, right? You have to, to figure out some some satisfactory configuration of the map to start the game on turns six or seven or eight, and have it be a four or three turn scenario where the Greeks do get Alexander and they get Alexander. That's a, that is a more, you know, more interesting thing that you get right away. And you're not waiting eight turns to get there to use Alexander. You can just play there and see how the game pans out. And that might be more interesting, right? You might, you might call that like the rise of Macedon scenario or something like that and, and do that as as a scenario rather than this full 10 turn one, right? I think the idea is interesting. I think the groundwork is there. Uh, you know, you have the companion uh, units, you have the special Macedonian uh, Aplates, you've got the Alexander leader and the, and the conquest card to use. Like all the special rules are still valid, but I think this scenario itself just is not as good as a 10 turn scenario. I really think it needs broken up into two. So maybe someday I will bother to do the, the legwork to modify this scenario. And I don't know how that would work, right? Like if I develop a, a redux of this and it leans heavily on the existing rules, am I allowed to post that to Board Game Geek? You know, is this C3i content just not permitted to be shared? Um, or modified in any way where I'm in some ways reproducing it for free on Board Game Geek, though, though possibly quite modified. I, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know the real logistics of that. But at the very least, I wouldn't mind trying to figure out, well, how do you do a Rise of Macedon version of this using much of the same um, rules, just that uh, it, it starts at a different time frame. And again, you put a different balance on the actions. Again, if you're working with a three-turn scenario or a four-turn scenario, that's a much different decision-making than if you're trying to plan ahead for a 10-turn game. Just just different. It just drives different actions. Maybe you split the game into three scenarios. Maybe it's, you know, turns one through three, then four through six or seven, and then eight, nine, ten. I mean, I, you, you could come at it a lot of different ways. Um, you just have to, to figure out, I guess, or the only missing component is um, a, a mid campaign setup order of battle again, six, you know, turn six or seven or eight or wherever you want to start. Maybe, maybe seven is the right one. You have a four turn game. Um, you know, you still have to figure out a way for Alexander to conquer all of this <laughs> in one turn. I don't know how well that works out. Um, even with the conquer card, um, uh, I guess with the Conqueror card, that's what makes the difference. But um, I don't know. I, th I think that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Like, you know a C3i magazine scenario is going to be a little bit different than the base game. It's not from the original designer of the game. It's maybe not as play-tested. Does out does some weird things. I do like what the scenario does. I think it has a lot of interesting special rules to kind of make it fit the period. I just think the 10-turn situation 
doesn't fit as well. And I think, again, there needs to be some limitation on how Carthage's economy needs separated from Persia's economy, even if you're going to count victory points together, how they spend the money and maybe even how they do activation markers needs to be a little bit different. Um, and maybe you only give the maybe you only give the Carthaginian player one activation marker all the time, and the rest are east. I mean, it, there's different ways to cut it, and it would need some level of play testing. And, and I'm not sure that I'm prepared to do any of that necessarily. But um, I think this needed a little bit more tweaking. And this is not a reflection on the base game at all. Um, I, I do think the base game systems seem to actually work okay. I certainly understand it a lot better now playing through it, um, and I can imagine how fun the base campaign could be. Just in this context, um, you know, there's there's some fiddly things to maybe tweak to really bring out its full potential. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to touch upon here. I, I think that's it. I mean, I, I've already spoken a lot to it. Um, it was an interesting play experience. I think some stuff came up where, like, truly C movement is the way to go because once you create a string of controlled ports, you can freely move along it and then... Wherever you put your galleys kind of is a natural buffer to keep your opponent's naval stuff from filtering through along here and trying to do something sneaky. So you sort of like, you know, you set a, a you know, the top of your cup and you fill in the cup. <laughs> That's maybe one way to look at it. Um, and so understanding how to make naval movement be effective is how you can actually make a lot of ground. Because trying to move... Trying to move from space to space in the middle of Asia Minor would take forever. There's a lot of mountains, but it's way easier, and I didn't do this enough. Like, the Greeks, I guess, could have tried to get back here and land and move this way and just use this as the, the true highway. Um, but, you know, that then you're dealing a lot more with naval battles, which are interesting. I mean, it's just, you know... There, there is plenty to consider here, and there's, like, good play and figure out how to make use of the good play. Truly, I think the naval movement is super-duper important to understand how to do and leverage correctly so that you can get to where you want to be and wreak havoc behind the enemy. But how do you, you know, the, the naval points, I think, are well thought out. Like, there's a, there's a choke point. There's a choke point right here. There's a choke point here. There's the deep-sea transit points obviously are dangerous, but that's how you kind of try to get to some places that are hard to reach otherwise, or you're hugging the coasts from you know, Carthage to Sicily to Brutium to Greece. Otherwise, it's hard to get through this big gap, right? I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's like well thought out in terms of the naval capabilities of the time. Um, all that's kind of interesting. But again, if, how this scenario all comes together, um, basically walking away saying it could maybe use some tweaks. Um, but gosh, if anyone else has played this scenario, is fortunate enough to have the game, have a C3 high scenario, have played it, because I don't think this scenario is in the Vassal module at all, um, let me know what you think. If, if, I've, if you think I've done something totally out of whack and not correct, let me know. Um, if you think uh, I'm just totally off base with my analysis, let me know. If you agree, good to know that you might agree, but... Um, it's hard to know. There's not just not an, has not been enough documentation of this particular scenario to make heads of tail heads or tails of it. Obviously, the other scenarios have gotten a lot more play because they just come with the game, um, even the second edition. So you know, it's it's an oddball thing. I am glad that I played this scenario to just try something different, uh, a fresh experience, so that I'm not duplicating effort for what people have recorded playing the base game. But I, I do kind of want to play the base game to see how it all shakes out, and if I did. I would play the uh, the Chaos in the Aegean, Greece and Turmoil version. Scenario 10 is a special modified version of the ultra-historical scenario where Greece is not a player power, but is instead treated more like the collection of city-states that it was. And I actually kind of like that idea more for historical reference because at very few times in the period that the game covers at all is Greece anything like a singular power. Um, so it makes more sense for, like, actual empires to be Rome and Carthage in the east, and then Greece is kind of doing various things that all three other players have to deal with, but is not a singular player. So technically, that's a three-player scenario, but I think it, it is probably a better historical representation 
Now that is also, I believe, designed by Dan, uh, who designed the C3I scenario. So maybe there's deficiencies there. That sounds harsh, harsher than I mean it. Um, but you know, it, it's going to come to the same territory, right? It's not a Richard Berg scenario. Are there are all the things lined up the way they should be? I don't know. Um, I am immensely appreciative of what Dan has done to add additional scenarios to the game. So I really do not mean to be harsh there. When I say deficiencies here, it is still related to the tweaks that I mentioned that I think are probably needed just to kind of help fine tune the scenario that is still very interesting um, and uh, worth checking out if you can do it. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this series. Sorry that it ended so early. I got to call it, but um, I think it was a good exposure to the system and kind of seeing the different ways that the system can bend and flex to do different things, but maybe still need some polishing um, besides the, the actual campaigns. Since I have this set up, the map is out, the counters are out, I might switch right into playing another campaign. I've got to see how I feel about it, but um, don't be surprised to see more Pax Romana videos coming very soon since, again, it, it's all set up. I don't have to put it away. I can just keep playing it. I've got a lot of other stuff I want to be putting on the tables just for this one. Um, just not there yet. Uh, or I've got other stuff on my other tables and I'm trying to figure out what to, to record. Still working that out. So thanks for watching, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, see you in the next one. Take care. Keep on gaming.